Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff Gambrone with uh, Mississippi in the Civil War. Uh, today, uh, in this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, physical reminders uh, of the war that uh, you can still see about the landscape in Vicksburg. In particular, I'm going to, to, going to talk about some soldier graffiti that uh, is uh, very much in evidence, you know, 158 years after the war uh, in, uh, at the Old Courthouse uh, Museum in Vicksburg. At the time of the war, it was the courthouse. Uh, it was probably one of the most prominent uh, buildings in the city because of its uh, lofty perch. And uh, it was really kind of a symbol of uh, the Siege of Vicksburg for a lot of people because it, uh, it, it was so prominent. And, you know, in Mississippi, there are reminders of the war uh, that are everywhere, uh, from Confederate soldier monuments that uh, are on the lawns of our county courthouses, to state historical markers that uh, li literally litter the landscape from the northern uh, part of the state all the way down to the, the Gulf Coast. And uh, really, uh, there are monuments and markers and memorials uh, to events both great, great and small all over the state. But uh, less common uh, relics of the war that can be identified to a specific soldier uh, are much less common, but, but they do exist. And the, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, a perfect example of this can be found at the old uh, Warren County Courthouse, uh, today known as the Old Courthouse Museum. Uh, this is a building that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I worked at the Old Courthouse Museum as a historian for nine years uh, early in my career, and they were nine of the best years of my life. I learned so much working under uh, Gordon Cotton, the director at the time. Um, it was a great place to, to learn how to be a historian, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But uh, the Warren County Courthouse uh, was, this, this particular building, construction started on it in 1857 after the old courthouse burned. Uh, it was built by the Weldon brothers, uh, George, William, and Thomas, uh, using a team of skilled slaves and uh, the courthouse was completed uh, in 1860 at a cost of about $100,000, which was a huge sum for a courthouse in those days. In fact, it was about $25,000 over the allotted budget. And sitting as it did on uh, top of a hill in the heart of Vicksburg, uh, during the siege of the city uh, in 1863, uh, this building would have been visible to both the Confederate defenders of the city and the Union attackers trying to take the city. And it really became kind of a symbol of uh, Confederate defiance uh, to the Union Army, uh, was sitting up on there on the hill there with the Confederate flag flying over it. So, uh, in a lot of ways, all eyes were were on this building uh, at the time of the at the time of the siege. Now, when the siege of Vicksburg ended on July fourth, eighteen sixty three, uh, the victorious Union Army marched into the city, uh, and. This particular painting is one that was commissioned by the state of Minnesota after the war, and it shows the 4th Minnesota Infantry marching into Vicksburg with the, with the courthouse in the background. And uh, the Union occupation troops, as they marched into the city, one of the very first things they did was march to the courthouse and put up the United States flag over the building. And that was really a powerful symbol that, uh, that Vicksburg had fallen. And for the remainder of the war, Vicksburg was under Union occupation, and the courthouse uh, was used by the Union Army. So there were numerous soldiers in and about the, the building during that time. Uh, occupation duty uh, left the Union soldiers stationed at Vicksburg with uh, uh, plenty of time on their hands. And uh, I think it's been true <clears throat> since the time of the Roman armies. Any time a soldier is bored and has got time on his hands, he can get destructive. And uh, fortunately for the courthouse, uh, the damage done by the uh, board soldiers wasn't anything severe. Uh, it was rather took the form of rather harmless graffiti carved into the large uh, slate blocks that fronted the, uh, the four porticos of the building. And just to show you some examples, in some cases, uh, soldiers just carved uh, their regimental designations into the, into the slates. For example, uh, some unknown soldier just carved 72nd Illinois or 72nd ILL into one of the slates. Uh, the 72nd Illinois Infantry uh, had uh, fought very hard during the Siege of Vicksburg. They had about 130 men killed. Uh, 
killed, wounded, or missing uh, during the May 22nd assault on the on the, the Confederate defenses alone. In 1917, they held a, a blue-gray reunion at Vicksburg for uh, Union and Confederate soldiers, and one of the men that attended was uh, Freeland H. Romans, who was a veteran of the uh, 72nd Illinois. And uh, he was interviewed by the local paper. He was one of the very first veterans to arrive, so the, the local papers just kind of jumped on him to get some uh, get some good color about the coming reunion. And uh, uh, in this interview, Roman stated, quote, uh, During the siege, I did guard duty at the courthouse, and the three months I spent in Vicksburg after its fall are among the happiest days of my life. I had no unpleasant duties to perform and made lots of friends. Of course, Vicksburg has changed. It is a different place, but I recognize a few old landmarks. And uh, I have to wonder if uh, Romans uh, made his way back up to the courthouse uh, during the, the, the reunion. He probably did, since it, it uh, had played such a large part in his memories of the city. And I wonder if he saw this, uh, this uh, inscription carved into the slate by one of his comrades in the 72nd. Then another example... If you can see here, right in the center, it's a little faint, but uh, it says 58th Ohio, and that is the 58th Ohio Infantry Regiment. Uh, they uh, also saw a lot of service during the Siege of Vicksburg. Uh, the uh, 58th Ohio had remained at Young's Point until February 8, 1863, when officials ordered the regiment uh, to serve on Union ironclads as guards. The ironclads uh, were uh, short personnel, so they decided to uh, uh, volunteer some infantrymen to, to serve on these uh, these ironclads, and the 58th is one of the units that got uh, chosen to do that. So uh, the 58th, uh, while serving as guards on these ironclads, uh, they uh, took part in a three-day engagement on the Yazoo River at Deer Creek uh, during U.S. Grant's Vicksburg campaign. Uh, the 58th were, uh, continued to remain on these ironclads uh, as they uh, bombarded Vicksburg uh, on April 29th, uh, the regiment uh, was participated in the bombardment of Grand Gulf, Mississippi, and then uh, they were also participated in various other uh, uh, excursions on the Mississippi and the Red Rivers. And uh, on September 1st, 1863, after the siege had ended, uh, the 58th Ohio was ordered to Vicksburg, where the regiment performed provost duty uh, for the remainder of its term of service, which ended in January 1865. So the 58th Ohio had a very long association with Vicksburg, uh, almost you know two years. So uh, you see quite a number of uh, of uh, men from that regiment uh, that carve their names into these slates, just because they spent so much time uh, in Vicksburg after the siege. Now another, and this is the uh, this is the uh, monument to the 58th Ohio that's out in uh, Vicksburg National Military Park. You know, Ohio, instead of making one big grand monument, decided to honor all of its regiments. So instead of putting up just one big grand monument to represent Ohio, they put up a marker for every single regiment in the state that fought at, at Vicksburg, which I think is a, is a very uh, cool idea. They made sure all of their, their regiments uh, got some kind of, uh, of marker. And then here's another example. Up here it says 81 Illinois, which would be 81st Illinois Infantry. And I'm not certain this J.W. Smith may be connected with that. It's hard to say. J.W. Smith is such a common name. <coughs> Excuse me. There were a number of J.W. Smiths in the 81st Illinois, but I don't know if that, that name may have been carved later. It, uh, but... Uh, in any way, uh, the 81st Illinois was another unit from the uh, the Sucker State that saw extensive combat uh, during the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, during the May 22nd assault alone uh, on Vicksburg's defenses, uh, the regiment suffered 11 killed and 96 wounded. And uh, like the uh, 72nd Illinois and the 58th Ohio, this regiment was going to stay at Vicksburg for quite a while after the siege. Uh, they were here at Vicksburg from July 4th, 1863 until March of 1864. So again, another unit that had lots of soldiers here for a long time. So it's not 
uh, uncommon to see 81st Illinois scratched into these uh, these slates just because they were here a long time and had plenty of opportunity to 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 do this sort of thing. And then this is a uh, photograph taken at Vicksburg of the field and staff officers of the 81st Illinois Infantry. And a lot of the regiments that were stationed in Vicksburg on occupation duty had their, their photographs made uh, uh, for uh, posterity. In fact, uh, if you check uh, Military Images magazine, I have an article on uh, uh, Union photographers in occupied Vicksburg that go into this subject in great detail if you're interested. Now another uh, regiment that you will see on the slates at the old courthouse is the 45th Illinois Infantry, also known as the, the uh, uh, Washburn Lead Mine Regiment because a lot of the men in the uh, in the 45th had been lead miners before the war, and uh, the 45th Illinois uh, was tasked with a, a very interesting duty during the siege. Uh, they were tasked with digging a mine under the Third Louisiana Redan, uh, one of the uh, Confederate fortifications uh, guarding uh, the Jackson Road entrance to Vicksburg, and. Uh, the Union sappers uh, in the 45th Illinois dug a tunnel 78 feet long uh, that reached under the 3rd Louisiana Redan, and then they dug out a big uh, cavern and packed it with 2,100 pounds of black powder. Uh, the, the powder was detonated on June 25th, leaving a crater 30 feet wide and 12 feet deep. And this illustration you see uh, is uh, of, uh, of the crater that was made. Uh, the 45th, along with other units, then charged into this crater, hoping to effect a breach in the Confederate uh, line. But the Confederates were prepared. They realized what the what the Federals were doing. They had dug an, uh, a new defensive line further back. The Federals were, were never able to get out of that crater. And uh, some very bloody fighting went on uh, there for hours and hours. Uh, the 45th Illinois had 83 men killed or wounded in the fighting at the crater. And the reminder of the 45th that's at the courthouse is this. Uh, this was carved onto one of the, uh, one of the uh, slate uh, footings of the, uh, on the portico of the courthouse. And uh, shown in the, in the picture back here, this is a photograph of some members of the 45th Illinois taken on the, uh, on the uh, grounds with the courthouse in the background. And the soldier that carved this, he only carved his initials and his unit, but fortunately he gave us enough information to identify him. It's, it says HCA Company H, 45th Illinois uh, Volunteer Infantry. And the 45th uh, really had distinguished themselves uh, during the siege. Uh, the 45th Illinois was given the honor of being the very first Union regiment to enter uh, the city of Vicksburg after the rebel forces surrendered. And uh, the uh, men uh, came to the courthouse, ran up a U.S. flag over the building. And so the, the 45th spent a good bit of, of time here on, on the courthouse grounds. And <clears throat> fortunately, with the full initials, the company, and the regiment, I was able to identify this guy. His HCA is Henry C. Ashbaugh, who was born in Ohio August 21st, 1844. He was uh, a newspaperman uh, when the war broke out, and uh, he enlisted in Company H of the 45th uh, Infantry on December 24th, 1861, when he was 17 years old. Uh, after the war, he moved to Kansas, and in William G. Cutler's History of the State of uh, Kansas, uh, the following was said about uh, Ashbaugh's service. They wrote, he enlisted in Company H, 45th Illinois Infantry, and served in that regiment until the fall of Vicksburg, when he was transferred to the printing department of the Army by General McPherson, where he remained until the, uh, nearly the close of the war. Uh, Ashbaugh was mustered out of service on December 23, 1864, and he went on to have a very uh, successful career as a newspaper uh, owner. He passed away March 13, 1916, and is buried at uh, Forest Hill Cemetery in uh, Eau Claire, uh, Wisconsin.
Now, I, I, this is the, the area where the 45th Illinois was located during the siege. This is a modern photo I took uh, some months ago, but uh, the Confederate works were off in the distance. You have here the Shirley House, the only surviving civilian residents still in the uh, the National Park. The 45th was uh, stationed all around this house. In fact, one of their approach trenches ran right through the front yard of the uh, of the Shirley House. But uh, I found one great story about Ashball that was published in the Evening Kansan Republican, Newton, Kansas, August 22nd, 1922. And it's, it's not about Vicksburg, it's about the Battle of Shiloh, but it's a great story. Uh, it's the, the, the account said, at the Battle of Shiloh, near noon of the first day, he was struck in the back by a spent canister shot from a rebel cannon and carried from the field, supposed to be mortally wounded. But by evening of the next day, I followed his regiment back to tents from which they had been driven the day before. And he must have been extremely lucky. Uh, it must have been a spent round that had just lost enough velocity that uh, it may have knocked the wind out of him, but it didn't penetrate. Uh, if you're familiar with canister, it was basically the Civil War equivalent of a giant shotgun shell. Uh, a canister round was an iron ball about the size of a golf ball. And those things could do an amazing amount of damage to an attacker uh, at close range. So it's it's he was very lucky to survive that uh, to survive that uh, that uh, that wound. Now the next thing oh and then forgot this is a picture of Ashball taken after the war. Um, really great picture. Um, Now the next name, uh, and this is a post-war, again later in life, uh, photograph of Ashball and of course the Battle of Shiloh. Now this next name took me a little while to figure out. So you can see it up here, and it looked like H something, and it's the last name started with an S, but uh, it took me a while to figure it out because I think at some point over the years someone had defaced the last name. Uh, but fortunately the the company and regiment were easier to make out. Company E 58 OVI and OVI stands for Ohio Volunteer Infantry. So uh, using the power of the internet I was able to find <coughs> a roster of the 58th Ohio Company E and I started looking for last names that began with an S and the first name began with an H, and soon enough, I found my man, uh, John Harriman Searle, S-E-A-R-L-E, who enlisted in the uh, 58th Ohio quite late in the war. Uh, he enlisted March 21st, 1865, uh, when he was 19 years old. And uh, he spent some quiet months at Vicksburg uh, at the tail end of the war. Uh, the regiment uh, didn't see any action uh, during that time period. They just would have been on quiet occupation duty. But, uh, uh, and he mustered out with the regiment on September 16, 1865. But uh, in doing a, a research on Searle, I found that uh, the 58th was not his first unit. He had also served in the 148th Ohio Infantry, which was a National Guard regiment. Uh, he had enlisted in that unit in May of 1864 for 100 days service. Um, and so he had, he had actually seen a, a little action with that unit, uh, although Again, he, I don't think he, they were involved in any, any kind of really heavy combat. Uh, they were part of the uh, Army of the James, and they were down at Ber Bermuda 100 in Virginia, and uh, basically in, in trenches. They may, he may have heard some uh, shots fired in, com in, in anger, but I don't think they saw any really kind of serious combat. But uh, after the war, uh, Searle married. Uh, he had a number of children, and he eventually moved out to California, uh, were, like a lot of Union veterans looking for a better life and uh, he died out there on August 20th 1924 and he's buried in the Sawtell National Cemetery in Los Angeles and this is a, a picture of uh, Searle it's really great when uh, you could take something like uh, this inscription that was carved you know almost a hundred and 60 years ago and you, then you can put a face with with the person I can just see him sitting there with a pen knife carving his name and unit in, into the slates I wonder if he ever imagined that uh, uh, it would still be there you know over a century and a half later um, 
it's just I love these little stories like this. It, it, I think it really brings the war home and uh, and, and makes you under appreciate the cost of the war for the individuals that that served in it. These are just a few of the names that are are on the slates at the old courthouse. There are plenty more. A lot of them are really difficult to read because they've been they've been worn down over time, but. Uh, uh, these little uh, these little gems are out there, and uh, it's really worth your while to look for them, um, because they really help I think to bring home the impact of the war in, in a really uh, in a tangible way. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, this has just been a short one. Uh, I hope you uh, I hope you give it a like, and uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. It really helps me to gauge how much interest there is, and uh, if you. Uh, uh, if you tell a friend about it, please do if you like it. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them. I'll try to answer them as best I can. And uh, thank you for viewing.